chapter 4, we're going to go through, God willing, we're going to go through all 11 verses this morning. So, if you would, if you're able, would you stand with me please and honor the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 4. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he was sitting like, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out of the throne, out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the, set, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this glimpse into heaven. We understand the setting may not be exactly what, uh, what thrills us. But at the same time, it, we, we see heaven in its magnificence as best as we can understand it. And so I pray, Father, as we open your word, I pray that you'll be glorified and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, since we took a, a quick Christmas detour, the book of Revelation swings at this point from the tour of letters written to seven churches in what we would call Turkey today, and makes a quick trip to heaven to unveil the holy throne there. The seven churches represent the types of churches that can be found at any time and in any place, while this glimpse of the throne represents the future of the universal church. Chapter 4 here is John's snapshot of heaven's throne room. And this vision will go through chapter 8. It will also take us into the vision of the Lamb and the scroll upon which several seals will be broken. We'll see God pictured as the conductor of an orchestra of all the events described in John's vision of the unveiling of the glory of Jesus Christ. God is pictured as being on the throne while the world is under his command and he will execute his plan while Jesus begins the final war with evil. It has not always been well received, but I believe all these claims from people to say that I have visited heaven other than the Apostle Paul 
are fraudulent or at least misguided. Now there are near-death experiences and there are often medicine-reduced mental trips where people have out-of-body experiences, but I just believe these have natural explanations because Scripture says that it is appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. It simply makes no sense to me why anyone from the second century on would have anything close to this. So John joins the club that Paul had what was its only member. People who were allowed a spiritual visit to heaven for explanation or revelation that would benefit the church regarding end times. Heaven is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. So when people say they, we, we don't know much about it, they're mistaken. We know everything about heaven that we're capable of understanding. In John's vision, God's people are allowed a look at their eternal residence. Or at least just the throne room. Paul, however, is not enabled to give a description that John is. Paul simply describes it as being indescribable. <laughs> and remember, John has already given us in chapter 1 a vision of the glory of Jesus. And by the time we finish chapter 5, we will have seen the most comprehensive description of heaven that is available to us. So let's delay no further. Let's delve into this marvelous tour of the throne of heaven. Look at verse 1. We'll see the open door and the first voice. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here. What? What must that have been like? Let me just interrupt you. Just, what must come up here? And I will show you what must take place after these things. Now, since, since we took a week off, it may be necessary to remind you that after these things refers to the completion of that first vision and then preparation for the next one. The phrase will repeat six more times throughout this book. It is a simple, straightforward shift of scenes. In this case, it's a shift from the church on earth to the church in heaven. This door allows John entry into the third heaven just like Paul in 2 Corinthians. He's been given a glimpse into the place where Jesus ascended after his ministry on earth and was triumphantly completed. John repeats the description of the voice of the exalted Jesus as like the sound of a trumpet from chapter 1. The voice is authoritative. It is commanding. It instructs John to come up here. And like Paul, he was spiritually transported into heaven for God's purpose and pleasure. The second use of after these things moves us from John's chronology to God's. In other words, it's a shift in focus from what we call the church age to the matters of end times, such as the tribulation, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal condition that will be detailed beginning in chapter 6 and running through the remainder of this book. Remember, we saw in chapter 3, verse 10, at least my interpretation of it, that his church will be spared from the hour of testing. So keep that in mind as we proceed. All the features that we see in this chapter can be organized based on how they relate to the throne of God, which will be mentioned 11 times in this chapter. He'll describe the throne and every aspect of it from every possible angle. Now let's look in verse 2 and 3 and we'll see the throne, the one seated there, and an emerald rainbow. It says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. By the power of the Holy Spirit, John is spiritually transported to heaven. 
And then John utters the familiar behold to describe that his attention has been captured. And I think it's better not to view this. I mean, I, I use about seven different um, commentaries when I'm looking through this. Mixed reviews on this. But I think it's probably better for us not to see this as a piece of furniture, but a spiritual representation of God's sovereignty and authority that's located in the temple of heaven. If you'll notice on the, the, the first little graph, the first little image that was up there, it just basically shows the brilliance there. You couldn't even actually see the throne. We'll see in chapter 21 that the temple of heaven is not an actual building. And it's better to understand that the temple of heaven is God and Jesus. The term temple represents the presence of God. The throne is said to be standing in order to represent God's sovereign rule being fixed and immovable. It says that God is in charge for all generations to come and he controls everything in what we call the universe. And that may sound weird to you at this point, but it will be comforting when we get to the end times descriptions that start in chapter 6 to know that God is still and always will be in control of everything, even when it may not seem so. And if you recall Isaiah's vision of God in chapter 6 of his book, from where we get the hymn, Holy, 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 you know that the prophet received great comfort during a traumatic time in Israel's history by receiving his vision of God on his throne. Now, the theory of evolution speculates that blind, purposeless, random forces are in control of the universe despite the mountains of obvious evidence to the contrary. Instead, the sovereign creator of the universe is in command. For the first century reader, the throne was occupied by Caesar, and he controlled half of the gross national product of the Roman Empire. So, <laughs> in spite of all this, all of his vast glory and wealth were nothing compared to the sovereign of the universe. The word for sitting here doesn't mean to imply resting as it does in Hebrews to describe Jesus. It described that God is ruling over the universe. God is reigning because judgment is about to take place. If you want to compare this to other visions of the throne of heaven, if you want to just jot these down, and we're not going to take time to go over them today, Daniel 7, 9 and 10. Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28, and then the one I just mentioned in Isaiah 6. People who are writing books today describing their fake experiences in heaven are flippant in their approach. While these Old Testament prophets were terrified and they were humbled by these visions. The description of the jasper stone and a sardius fairly closely resemble Ezekiel's vision. Now we'll see many weeks from now, we get to chapter 21, we'll see that jasper is crystal clear. So we should see it pretty much like we would see a diamond today. And the, the, the neat part about a diamond, is, as many of you know, is this is, this is th through a diamond you can see the, the refraction of all the colors in the spectrum. There's nothing <laughs> that Caesar could have manufactured that would resemble an emerald circling the throne like a rainbow. Now, these stones symbolize great wealth, but you have to understand that God put them where they, where they are. God is not described here as we see him on the throne. It's just that because he is, as, as, as I mentioned about Paul, he is indescribable. His radiance was brilliant. And every time we've looked at his glory in different places, that's about all you can say. His radiance is brilliant. As powerful as Caesar was, he was just a man. 
Only God is God. Now Sardis, which is where the name of the city Sardis that we saw a few weeks ago originates, is a bright, almost flame-like ruby. It describes not only God's glory, but his wrath, which will soon be delivered to the people of the unregenerate world. In Exodus 28, we'll see that the Sardius and the Jasper were the first and the last stones on the breastplate of the high priest, and they represented the first and last of Jacob's 12 sons and also represented God's covenant relationship with Israel. His wrath and his judgment will not destroy that relationship. We can't see John's vision of the throne room of heaven as merely splendor and beauty and fantastic sights. There's no comfort and joy here. It's spectacular for sure, but it describes the wrath that begins in chapter 6. Now, last week we saw angels praising God because that's what angels do. As we study through Revelation, we see these men who have seen these great visions, we'll see that they praise God. Look for things like this, whether it's in the names or the attributes of God, for which we can praise Him. May we be like the angels of Christmas, of whom it can be said that we praise God because that's what His people do. Now He describes what surrounds the throne. He's already mentioned the rainbow that had the glow of an emerald in it, so see it as primarily green, providing a comforting balance to the fiery notes of judgment from the throne. And we know that Genesis 9 says a rainbow represents God's covenant faithfulness not to destroy the world again with water, so his grace and his mercy are shown here. Since his attributes operate harmoniously, his wrath never arrives by violating his faithfulness. Look at verse 4. We'll see around the throne and upon the throne. It says, around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. But he also saw 24 elders sitting on 24 additional thrones. Now some people will interpret this as angels. But every time the word elders is used, it always refers to men. And you can tell by the words, not just men, but older men. Therefore, that's why the word elder sticks with it. There are sometimes you can go into churches and they say, well, we're... we're uh, run by a board of elders, and you'll see there's somebody in here who's like 28. Well, okay, the word Greek word presbyteros means somebody who's old. So if you want to be an elder someplace, you need to be relatively old. We've seen this already. White garments are primarily used to describe clothing of true believers. White garments symbolize Jesus' righteousness is transferred to believers at the point of salvation. The fact that the elders have gold crowns is further evidence that they were humans. Because for one thing, crowns were never promised to angels. And the crown in Greek refers to the champion's prize. Jesus promised this trophy to believers in Smyrna, if you can remember that far back. The number 24 has a number of options, most of which connect to Old Testament issues or even directly to Israel. Some people say that 12 represent Israel and 12 represent the church. But individual Jews will continue to be redeemed at the time of this vision, but the nation as a whole has not been. The best option in my research is that they represent the raptured church, which, as we'll see next week, sings the song of redemption. Look in verse 5, and we'll see that from the throne and before the throne. Verse 5 says, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
Throughout Revelation, thunder and lightning indicates significant events occurring in heaven. Now you can recall this in other places in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, most noticeably at the giving of the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai. We will see them on three more occasions as we go through this book. They are also associated with the presence of God as seen in Ezekiel's vision, but during the tribulation, we see them associated with God's judgment. Now these lamps are not like the lampstands that we saw in chapter 1. They are like outdoor torches, giving off a fierce and a fiery blaze. Just like chapter 1, the phrase, seven spirits of God, refers to the fullness or completeness of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, torches are associated with war. John is seeing God preparing for war against sinful people who have rejected or ignored God's plan for salvation. The Holy Spirit would then be his war torch. In essence, this throne represents the final Sinai. Now let's look at verses 6 through 8. We'll see before, in the middle, and around the throne. It says, And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes, in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. Now this is worded a bit awkwardly in English, but we need to see this as, a, as metaphorical rather than literal, since there is no large body of water in heaven. John saw a huge piece of crystal clear glass at the base of the throne. And in the first century, glass in and of itself was rare, and crystal clear glass was extremely rare. But a sea of glass points to the magnificence and the holiness of God. Heaven is a world of brilliant light refracting and reflecting light and color in a kaleidoscope for the senses far beyond our ability to describe in human terms. And even if we could imagine it, we couldn't describe it because we're human and it's not. He also introduces the four living creatures in the innermost circle around the throne. They are not animals. The Greek word zoon, from which we get zoology, just means they're alive. Their mysterious eyes depict their alertness and their awareness. Nothing escapes their purview. You probably remember hearing your mother say that she had eyes in the back of her head. So it's kind of much more than that. Their similarity to the cherubim of Ezekiel's vision allows us to conclude that they are angelic beings. Cherubim refers to an exalted order of angels usually representing God's holy power. The lion represents wild creatures. The calf symbolizes domestic animals. The eagle represents flying creatures and the man depicts the pinnacle of creation. As you may have guessed, the 12 tribes of Israel are camped under these four headings. Reuben would be symbolized by man, and the tribes who are like Dan would be represented by the eagle. Those that are like Ephraim would be represented by the calf, and the rest would be like Judah, who would be embodied as a lion. Their six wings show that their ultimate responsibility is to worship God. In Isaiah's vision, four of the six wings of the cherubim represented worship. Now let's look at the latter part of 8 and verse 9. We'll see glory to him who sits on the throne. Finishing verse 8, it says, And day and night they do not cease to say, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. We'll stop there. But you've heard me say many times how in both Hebrew and Greek, repetition is used for emphasis. Here, 24-7, 365, triple repetition of the word holy communicates ultimate and complete holiness. And again, this closely resembles Isaiah 6. The phrase Lord God Almighty depicts the ultimate divine warrior. Churches facing persecution gain tremendous comfort knowing that regardless of what happens on earth, God is Almighty and He is Lord. Believers who perse persevere in persecution will one day join with the angels singing this praise to God. The phrase who was and is and is to come summarizes God's separation from time. He is transcendent. He is other. He is not bound by time and space. He has been God. He is God. He always will be God. You and I were born, and a few years later, we will die. Our eternal position with God depends on our acceptance of His plan of salvation. The heavenly throne room choir here begins with a quartet of living creatures. And we'll see it build in the rest of chapter 4 here and in chapter 5 as well. This section centers on creation, while the next chapter deals with redemption. The four living creatures here refer to God's great power. God identified himself as almighty to Abraham in Genesis 17. It shows him as the most powerful being, having no weakness and no worthy adversary. Because he is almighty, he can effortlessly perform whatever his holy will purposes to do. The living creatures demonstrate total worship and complete submission to God, who is far more worthy of worship than any living being because he is eternal. His throne symbolizes his power and authority. Look in verse 10 and we'll see the crowns before the throne. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Now these verses are the second hymn that is sung in Revelation, and they comprise a hymn of praise to God for his work as creator. Here's the summary point of the chapter. All creatures in heaven and earth praise and worship God because He is the creator and the sustainer of everything. Caesar couldn't make that claim. And no ruler alive today could either. No one can claim to be eternal or the ultimate creator. God is the eternal creator. Here we see the great worship choir filling up. The quartet of living creatures is joined by the 24 elders and countless angels in praising God for who He is. However, we must remind ourselves that this is not singularly a praise service. This is preparation for judgment. And the aspect of His power most clearly in view here is His power in judgment. God is indeed long-suffering for which I personally am grateful. But you can think of many illustrations from Scripture, beginning with expelling Satan and other rebellious angels from heaven to demonstrate that, that he must judge because he is holy and just. And as powerful as he is portrayed in creation, he is similarly to be considered in judgment. And in a rather unexpected response, the elders have flattened themselves face down in front of the throne, 
where they throw the crowns they have been awarded. The Greek word here for cast is ekbalo, and you can see the English word ball that's there, and then the preparation ek means out of. Thus, a ball out of means something that has been thrown. And you don't have to see this as a fastball, it can be a short toss. The point is here, they are unconcerned about their personal reward, or even the holiness that has been transferred to their account by the blood of the Lamb. Such trophies become worthless when compared to the everlasting glory of the only true Holy One. See the proper attitude here. We collect trophies and the applause of men. As Christians, our trophies look dinky compared to the glory of God. The 24 elders add this own, their own note to this hymn of praise. Proclaiming God's worth because of His creation. The Greek word for worthy is axios, which simply means of weight, as in the measuring of something, or of worth as in describing something's value, perhaps intangibly. In fact, the Greek word for worthy was used regarding the Roman emperor in triumphal processions. Throughout scripture, God is portrayed as creator. The focus of the elder's song here is on God's glory in creation, which is, other than scripture, the prevailing way by which God reveals his existence. The song of the elders acknowledges his right and his desire to redeem and to judge his creation because he is its creator. The hymn of praise portrays God preparing to judge Satan, demons, and sinners and to repossess his creation. In his benediction to the theological section of Romans, at the end of chapter 11, Paul cites the book of Job as he writes in verses 33 and following. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. As the Father, God is the true source of everything because he created it. It is only because of his desire and his purpose that anything or anyone exists. And I don't have time here to, to enter the creation evolution debate, but understand this. As I mentioned a minute ago, evolution has no purpose. God's creation has a purpose to glorify him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we just we join in and echo these words of the Apostle Paul. From you, through you, and to you are all things. And we thank you for the fact that everything that we know, everything that we have, everything that we do is a result of of the fact that you have created us here. We pray, Father, as, as your creation, that we would follow you in a way that would glorify you. Hear our prayer, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Alyssa, if you've got a few minutes, would you come up? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. If there's anything that, uh, that you want to do business with, if you want to unite here with our church locally, or if you need to get right with the Lord while she uh, plays and sings, uh, I'll be down front. You come. <laughs>